Valley Docks uh, for the invitation. Uh, we're very pleased to be here, and uh, I'm going to say, I'm trying to be brief. We're going to try and say a few words about the work of the Gulf Labor Coalition to begin with, and then uh, some of my comrades will talk about the work of uh, Gulf, which is a global ultra luxury faction, which is the direct action spin off of Gulf Labor Coalition. Uh, our, our basic analytic, basic analysis is high culture, hard labor. It's really very simple. I think most of you probably understand it. And there's an even more, there's an even simpler equation which goes along with it, which is that the more prestigious a cultural event or institution, the more likely it is that workers will be asked to work for free or, or will be asked to work at a discount. And uh, except with the exception being the very few cultural workers that have a claim on intellectual property, and so they share in some of the spoils and the rewards at the very top of the uh, at the top of the, the money hierarchy that goes with high culture. The Venice Biennale is probably the best example of this. Um, we are actually. Uh, we're actually official uh, participants in the Venice Biennale this year, Gulf Labor Coalition. Don't ask me how or why, but we are. Uh, and so, in fact, our, our presentation here is part of the work we're doing in Venice, and we will be back here in residence at the end of July through August the 10th, doing various workshops, and we want to work with Sally Docks on that also, so uh, there'll be workshops that will also be directed at the, the local political economy of culture here in, in, in Venice itself. And I should mention that, uh, just to illustrate the first point I made, um, the assistant to the curator of the Venice Biennale, in one of the conversations I had with her, I asked her how many Biennales she'd worked on, she said five. This is, the, this is the first Venice Biennale she's worked on. But she said that uh, the equation that I mentioned at the beginning, the more prestigious the event, the less likely people are to be paid. Venice was way up there. <laughs> Relative to the other Biennales, people got paid more. But with Venice, people are getting paid nothing. And that includes most of the participating artists. Um, so, it's, uh, it's, it, that's an illustration of what I was saying. So, Gulf Labor Coalition um, is an international group of artists and writers, and we formed five years ago. And it's an artist initiative, but it's also a solidarity initiative. And the solidarity in this case is with uh, these workers, and they are migrant workers in the United Arab Emirates. And um, they're very badly treated. And migrant workers are treated badly everywhere in the world, including in Italy, including in the US where I live. But the Gulf states are a very special case. 90% of the residents 90% of the population in these countries are, are migrant workers. They have no rights whatsoever. They are uh, they're brought to the Gulf. They're seduced to come to the Gulf by the so-called Gulf Dream. They mostly come from South Asia, from India, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, from Nepal. And they have this Gulf Dream of um, relative riches. They're going to earn a lot of money there, and then they can come back home and do things for their family. Of course, this is a recruitment tactic, and so they find when they come to the Gulf that things are not as they were promised. And the Gulf dream is an illusion. It's a mirage in the desert. They are being paid a lot less than they were promised. They, uh, they discover that their passports are taken away from them, so they have no mobility. They are entirely subject to the whim of their sponsor, because they all need, they need a sponsor to come to, the, to these countries. Um, they suffer overwork in very punishing conditions, up to 40 degrees of heat. In the UAE, 
no one is supposed to work when the temperature goes to 40 degrees. And so officially the temperature never hits 40. That's one of the, the, uh, the family jokes uh, inside the workforce. Um, and they're subject to all sorts of other kinds of labor abuses with which I'm sure you're familiar. But the important thing is, because they're migrants and they have no rights, if they say anything about it, then they are arrested and they are beaten and they are deported. And anyone in that 90% of the population is subject to those, that same regime of being deported. So, where, do, where does the culture come in? This is a, an image of Sadia Island, which is a, a, a $30 billion real estate venture off the coast of Abu Dhabi. And the royal family in the UAE has decided to purchase some very world-class cultural brands. It has the money to do that. And uh, this is the Guggenheim, the Guggenheim Museum. It isn't built yet, but that's what it was supposed to look like. This is the Louvre, which is almost built. And this is the National, uh, the National Museum of the UAE, which the British Museum is helping to, um, to plan. These are the three big brands, and over here is uh, New York University, um, which is another brand that was purchased. New York University happens to be my employer. They pay my salary. Um, and so <clears throat> we decided that uh, these three brands were pressure points. Um, that we had some influence over these three brands, four brands actually, um, and uh, we have no influence over the other multinational corporate brands that operate in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but we do have influence over these. So we decided to put pressure on each of these brands with the ultimate goal of raising the labor standards in the region and breaking the sponsorship system, which is called the kafala system, which entraps uh, so many migrant workers. And it's a debt trap, specifically, because in order to get to the Gulf, they have to take on a massive amount of debt, almost $2,000 on average, which is a lot of money for these people. And they spend two years working just to pay off the debt. So this is a system of debt bondage. Otherwise, it would not work. No one would work under those conditions unless they had to pay off their debts. Here's a graphic uh, that the International Trade Union Confederation put together. It's not our graphic, it's theirs. They refer to slavery. We don't use that term. Um, we don't, we, we, we're a little more specific um, about how we talk about the conditions, but this gives you a sense of the wage disparity and you can see that this is somewhat embarrassing for, for the Guggenheim. Um, let me talk a little bit about the tactics we've used in the campaign because we've used multiple tactics. Um, the boycott is an international boycott of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, which we called four years ago. And over 2,000 artists and curators and writers around the world have signed on to the boycott. They will not, they, they interpret the boycott as they will. Some people interpret it very broadly that they will boycott all, all, Guggen, all Guggenheims, but most people are boycotting the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. And uh, this, is, this is a very effective, initially was a very effective uh, tactic. It put us uh, on the radar. It put us on the map and gave us a lot of visibility, which any campaign needs to have, public visibility. Public education is something that we, we, we take very seriously and we do in a variety of ways. Uh, this is a form of public education. Uh, we also publish in print, we talk to the press, uh, we make films. Um, we do all sorts of, because we're cultural workers, we're pretty good at doing this kind of thing. So public education has been important and happens in a number of ways. Dialogue is something that we do privately with the museum officials. Every so often we sit down and we talk with uh, uh, the, the, the hierarchy, the museum officials, mostly the artistic directors of the museum. And these are usually very boring conversations, 
uh, but they're, they're, they're very interesting ethnographically for us. Um, we reached the point where we don't think they're useful anymore um, because after five years of having these conversations, uh, the, the museum is, is intransigent at this point. So public negotiation is something uh, I would describe is something we do as a result of public education. Um, we are in a kind of bargaining position, not a real bargaining position, uh, but it's a form of theater where we're sort of in negotiation with the state, with the state of the UAE. Uh, we, we're not the people who will negotiate with the UAE on behalf of the workers. The International Labour Organization ultimately will do that. And we're, we're in contact with labour allies internationally over this. It's a multi-pronged campaign with lots of allies and partners, including Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the International Trade Union Confederation that I mentioned, and also the International Labour Organization. Field research is uh, something that we've done. We take trips to Abu Dhabi and we visit the labour camps and we talk to the workers. Um, we're often followed uh, by, uh, by the police, so it's a little uh, dodgy to do that kind of work, especially not so much for us, but for the workers themselves. So we have to be very careful about the interviews that we do. Um, field research, uh, 52 weeks is, um, was a campaign that ran for 52 weeks where artists who were either part of Gulf labor or who were allies produced agitprop artwork in various ways that addressed some of the issues of the campaign. Um, so that was another strategy and um, alternatives. We ran a, uh, a, a spoof um, competition. Uh, initially it was a hoax. Uh, we announced uh, that the Guggenheim was abandoning its plans uh, to build uh, a museum designed by Frank Gehry in Abu Dhabi and instead was calling for alternative designs for a museum, an ethical museum that would be attentive to environmental and labor issues. Um, we didn't get any submissions because it was a, it was a pretend uh, campaign, a pretend competition, but then we did actually have a real competition in Helsinki. Uh, the Guggenheim is hoping to have a, a museum in Helsinki. It's a very controversial project. It's, people are polarized in Helsinki, those who are pro-Guggenheim and those who are against. And so we decided uh, we would co-sponsor an alternative design competition. Um, not, not for a blockbuster museum, but for ideas and projects that would uh, fuse art, the arts and urbanism in very innovative ways. Because there's a lot of public money that is being set aside for the Guggenheim Helsinki and we thought there's a much better way of using that money. And so we had, um, three weeks ago in Helsinki, we, we, we announced the winners of the competition. We had over 200 entries um, uh, from more than 40 countries. And you can look at some of them on the next Helsinki website. Um, I think the whole thing was done for 5,000 euros, the whole competition. The Guggenheim Helsinki official competition cost tens of millions of dollars so far. Um, and the last thing is direct action. Uh, a year ago, uh, we decided, partly because of the, um, the lack of uh, progress with our private dialogue with the museum, that we would start doing direct action. So we spun off um, a direct action group called Gulf Global Ultra Luxury Faction. And um, this is where I'm going to turn it over to uh, Amina and Natasha, who are going to talk about the work of Gulf. Um, we had all worked together in the debt resistance movement and we decided to use some of our analysis of debt in a different context to internationalize um, 
to internationalize that analysis and, and they can talk about the project and where, where, how it gave birth to golf.